Hi guys. Hi. Welcome. <coughs> I'm not gonna use this mic. Can everyone hear me? It feels like I'm under oath when I do this, and I don't. <laughs> I don't want that. So, welcome to the April humidity edition of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group, a joint venture between the R Street Institute and New America Foundation. Uh, get together with monthly meetings. We run the legbranch.org blog, talking about all ways to make Congress work just a little bit better. So. Today's edition is uh, on, on committee staff, staffing trends in general, uh, a, a year-long project between myself and Mr. Dukeman uh, on the end there about committee staffs uh, looking to test assumptions, um, challenge assumptions, really get to know uh, the people that, that run the legislative committees that we know are so important to the legislative process. Um, as a late addition to the panel, we have Dr. Elsie Scott. The executive, the interim uh, president and CEO of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Um, she's here to talk about something that the report does not cover that's ethnic diversity uh, on the Hill in general within committees, the work that she's involved in across a, a various organizations to, to talk about the other important topic of diversity on the Hill, particularly as we work with the most diverse. Congress in our history, um, and she can talk about leadership development, all the things staffer have told us over and over again that they need to do their job, uh, why they lead, uh, kind of the, the hopefully a, a full, full conversation about staff, why it's important that they stay, uh, why we need to change motivations and incentives for them. Um, so I'm going to uh, pass it off to Dr. Elsie Scott, then we're going to, Ryan and I, uh, Ryan Dukeman is going to PhD school in the fall, so wish him luck there at Princeton. <laughs> and uh, he's helped me, he's been uh, invaluable on, on creating this committee report. So we'll talk about main findings, methodology, what's lacking, what's next, and then we'll open it up for, for questions at the end because hopefully there are some. So, with further ado, Dr. Go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Hey. <laughs> doesn't work anyway, I don't think. So, okay, can you all hear me in the back? All right. Well, it's my pleasure to be a late addition to the group, and uh, what I'm going to spend my short time, I have primarily talking about a study that was published by the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, which I was one of the uh, researchers on the study. It was published last uh, September, <coughs> looking at uh, racial diversity among U.S. House staff. Prior to this report being published, the Joint Center had done a previous study looking at the Senate side in 2015. And it was interesting when the Senate study was produced and showed the lack of diversity, total lack of diversity on the Senate side of staffers. Then uh, there was an interest in looking at the House side because everybody said the House would be so much better. <laughs> and we did find that uh, it is better, uh, 3%. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, what I'll do is talk about some of the major findings. You can go online, just Google Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, and you can download a copy of this report as well as the Senate report. And then there's been a follow up to this where the Joint Center is drilling down even, even further, looking at the House side. But just briefly on the Senate report that was published in 2015, that it was shown that there was only one member of the Senate that had a black chief of staff, mm. and that was Tim Scott, who happened to be black. And so uh, that, that didn't serve very well. It didn't look well at all uh, for the Senate. <coughs> and despite the fact that when uh, Reed was here as the majority leader, he had started some efforts to try to increase diversity. He had, uh, one of his staffers had started getting resumes, but it really had not made a Im major impact. But after this study was, was published, the Senate study, Doug Jones was elected to the Senate from Alabama. And Doug Jones heard about the study evidently and Joint Center President Spencer met with him and provided him with some candidates uh, because <coughs> one of the things we hear from the senators and the House members, they can <coughs> find diverse staff. And he ended up hiring uh, an African-American chief of staff. And on the Senate side, there has been some improvement as a result of the uh, Senate study. But the House study, we expected the House to look better because the House is more diverse. 
that in this Congress you have 50, 57 black members in the on the House side, and nine of them are are new. But this study was done right before the election because we wanted it to hit, we wanted to hit the streets before or around the time of the election, so that when people get elected, this would be on their mind and their constituents would also be asking them about who are you going to hire. But we only looked at the top three staffers in the uh, in the office. That's the chief of staff, the legislative director, and the communications director. Some people took issue with us defining these as the top three, but it's sort of generally accepted that these are tend to be the top three. But we had more issues after, you know, we started letting some of the members see some of the data uh, right before we produced it. And uh, we got more pushback saying, you know, I got a black deputy chief of staff, my legislative director is a Latina, <laughs> and these types of things. But we, we said we had to establish some criteria of research, and you have to establish a definition and stick with that definition. So our definition of top staffers was legislative directors, uh, chief of staff, and comm directors. So what's the major findings we had, and then hopefully at the end we'll have <coughs> time for some questions that people of color, we, we define people of color as black, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans. And we found that when we look at the population, 38% of the U.S. population, people of color, but only 13.7% of all top staff, uh, house, house staffers are people of color. Of the 329 personal offices of white members, only 16, that's under 5%, were led by chiefs of staff of color. Six of those worked for Democratic members, and 10 worked for Republican members. In the personal offices of white Democratic members, less than 8% of the top staff are people of color, even though those offices represent districts that on average are over 37% people of color. And so the very interesting part of this study was that there was more diversity on the House side, but it was primarily because you have more people in Congress on the House side, and especially the Congressional Black Caucus. The Congressional Black Caucus had the best track record in terms of hiring people of color in the top three positions. At, uh, not one Latina, Asian American, or Native American serves in any of the 40 <coughs> committee staff director positions, because we looked at committee staffs also, full committees. And any of the 24 top staff positions in the four top leadership offices in the House. So the only people of color that were found in those positions were African Americans. Nearly three quarters of U.S. House members have no top staff of color. Now this was done before the election, so <coughs> hopefully there's some significant change since the last election. Uh, on it, uh, see. Even though these members represent districts that on average are 26% people of color, less than 1% of members, top staffers, are black. And just try to wrap this up. While Democratic Congressional Hispanic <coughs> Caucus members on the average have districts that are 61% Latino, collectively their personal offices had less than 28% Latino, so we were sort of surprised at that. Whereas on the other hand, when we look at the Congressional Black Caucus members, Congressional Black Caucus members in their personal offices hire a greater percentage of top staff of color, just over 63%. And this is much higher than any other caucus <coughs> in Congress. And so, in terms of recommendations that uh, we made as a result of these findings, <coughs> that, uh, oh, the other thing that we found also, the black caucus members were more likely to have women in these top positions. Now, what we did in the back of the, uh, something that was different from the Senate study, that uh, Spencer Overton came up with the idea of publishing a list of congressional districts with over 33% people of color that had zero staffers of color. And uh, this has bugged a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> as they went to look at this list and to find themselves that 
<laughs> on this list, uh, and some people call it a list of shame, but <laughs> it's a list. And you all can go online after this and see if your members <laughs> are listed there. But just to call out, call out one, <laughs> Beto O'Rourke, 85% of his district population is non-white, and he had zero people of color on his top staff. So, uh, and there's quite a few of them with primarily people that represent large Hispanic populations. But there's one listed on here that has the majority black population that uh, does not have any people of color in top staff. Okay, so what we what we recommend is that we need to uh, be able to collect, we need data, that the House needs to collect data. And we know that there has been some movement by the Speaker's office. There's now a diversity office. And so uh, we think that there's going to be a lot of positive actions coming out of this study, and also because you have members of Congress that are pushing for more diversity. And we recommend they use the Rooney Rule. Those of you who will follow the NFL know what the NFL does in terms of requiring that for every coaching uh, job that there should be at least one person of color interviewed. So we have recommended they do something similar. And I think I've heard Speaker Pelosi uh, saying this and recommended it. And we also recommended uh, paid internships. Now there's legislation for paid internships. So. Uh, so we think that we're having a big impact on, uh, on where we go from here. And so there are some other recommendations, but I think my time probably is up. And so I thank these guys for adding me so I could come in and talk about this. Very interesting. So we're going to let that sit. So not a ton of good news there, but hopefully some transitions are changing. And then that leads pretty well into what Ryan and I have spent the better part of the last year doing. Um, Dr. Scott talked about the importance of establishing definitions, of establishing fact patterns. I can't tell you the number of times that I've had conversations with committee staff or, or members themselves that say that my office is different or my, uh, my staff is different. It's not me that's part of the problem. It's everyone else. And there is some truth to that sometimes. but. If it's true across multiple offices at one time, it's worth studying. And even if not, it's worth putting numbers behind uh, the, the people that actually serve, that we can talk about these things uh, with numbers backing them so we talk about them knowledgeably and then ultimately make recommendations based on good data rather than just uh, observations or assumptions or what we see walking around here. So that was the, the motivation within committees. Um, personal offices are getting uh, more and more attention. Uh, you see a lot of and it's usually the result of bad behavior on the part of bosses and staffers. Um, shaming, uh, you see scandal, sexual harassment, the Me Too, movement hit, Me Too movement hit Capitol Hill too. So there's changes that are happening and it, it all relies on attention. Uh, what we found was that committees, the ones that are actually doing the day-to-day -day grunt work of policy making, oversight as much as it gets done, uh, aren't getting the same amount of attention. And just like every personal office is a, is a business of itself, that it, it varies by your members' personality, what they're interested in. Committees are the same way. Jurisdictions are huge. Some uh, committees have over 100 staffers. Some have less than 20. Um, some staffers get paid on certain committees. Some people don't pay their staffers as well. They stay for varying long, uh, periods of time. So it really matters when you're looking committee by committee. So that's why this, this labor of love was created, just to try to establish some fact patterns across committees over time. And so there's a, there's a lot of a lot of action going on in here. I, I encourage you to read the report to chew through it. It is not a fun read. It's not. I wouldn't even call it entertaining, and I wrote it. So, but it's really important, just for no other reason, that we can talk a little more informed about uh, uh, the assumptions that we may or may not have. And then another motivation for this is the House created a, a committee, a select committee, to study itself, to make recommendations for improvement, and the chairman. Derek Kimmer out of Washington is really, really focused on staff uh, issues, whether it's pay, tenure, keeping them off K Street, and keep thinking of Congress as a career in and of itself, uh, talking about issues of diversity and gender discrepancy, pay gaps, all of it's on the table, so we're in a unique moment uh, where staffing is not the sexiest topic, believe me, I know, uh, but it's an important one just because of 
how much we know they influence the legislative process. The members <coughs> themselves are extremely busy and they have no choice but to rely on their higher dates to do it, so let's make sure that we're getting the best and brightest and keeping him here uh, and thinking of Congress as a career and not just a stepping stone to something better, something more uh, better paying. Um, so those are the motivations behind this study. Um, I'm going to pass it to the research assistant that I relied on infinitely to create this thing. He's going to talk about the methodologies, where what we can say authoritatively, what we can't, uh, and then maybe we'll bounce back and forth with some main findings, um, talk about where we want to go from here, and then open it up to, to questions and takeaways. Awesome. So, yeah, as Casey said, um, you'd be surprised in the methodology, one of the main problems we are dealing with here that's kind of broadly applicable to dealing with questions of Congress is that congressional data or information broadly defined is transparent and pretty widely available. There are pretty robust transparency requirements for things like congressional pay, financial disclosures, um, staffing uh, requirements, things like that. <coughs> but it's very decentralized. As Casey said, the Hill is you know hundreds of different individual small businesses legally. Uh, it's not one centralized um, hiring authority. And the data is very poorly structured. So you can imagine when you're looking at questions across committee staff or across personal offices, you might be looking at like PDFs on a member's website, you might be looking at how the House and Senate report things differently. So the data are kind of broadly available but really poorly structured and that was something we were trying to, to deal with here is you know, an aim of our report overall is to begin to bring through just basic descriptive statistics that had not really been produced before um, a structured and quantitative approach to the study of congressional staffing. Um, to at least get to a sense where, uh, to a point where further research can build on what the causes are, um, kind of getting at drivers, but we needed to present a basic picture right now of what is the current state so that we could get at um, those questions and the select committee can get at questions of congressional staffing um, that others can, can further build on. And so just to quickly walk through how we actually did this, we started with uh, data that's released at the payment level, so um, by Legistorm, so they maintain a committee staff directory that has um, payment level units of analysis uh, in the House side every quarter for every staff member and in the Senate um, twice a year. And so we were able to track this data over the course of February to October of last year. Um, we analyzed that data and aggregated it up to a staffer level, so instead of looking at like each payment that was made, we looked at um, the unit of like each person who works on the Hill. Um, we additionally added by sort of manually coding this, looking at the payment records, right? When did you stop getting paid by the Committee on Homeland Security? When did you start getting paid by uh, the Speaker's office instead or something like that? To get at notions of mobility and tenure on the Hill. <coughs> um, so we tracked three kind of different measures of tenure for each person um, who worked in a committee from 2001 to the present. And those were their tenure in their current position, their tenure in the committee or office that they work for, um, I'm sorry, and then the, um, the tenure in Congress as a whole. So we're looking at different measures of how experienced a staff member is, both in terms of expertise across the Hill, but also in terms of like the direct role that they um, are staffed with now. We also standardized this, uh, kind of rolling up the data to look at um, some degree of apples to apples comparisons. You can imagine some committees just call everybody a professional staff member. Some committees are very detailed and say, you know, special legislative assistant for Homeland Security investigation. So we're trying, we tried to roll those up into broadly defined labor categories to try and look at how pay and diversity issues um, differ within levels of seniority on the Hill. <coughs> um, lastly, as uh, Casey and Dr. Scott mentioned, the basic limitations here just due to the data availability and kind of ease of use within the confines of the scope of this project um, cover things like racial and ethnic diversity, um, as well as kind of disaggregating and getting a better sense of like position groupings, um, more looking more specifically at what the distinctions are in a professional staff member in one committee versus another. Um, and we, we call those out in the report as areas for future research to build on. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of how we created this report. And I'll just talk briefly about one of the main findings on the next uh, slide for those of you who have a packet. Um, so the first of those uh, is that the sort of quote unquote prestigious committees in Congress do in fact tend to have the most experienced staffers, at least when looking at uh, measures of experience as defined by the tenure on that committee. 
right? So if you look at uh, in the House side, it's appropriations, it's judiciary, the budget committee, um, up there also are armed services and foreign affairs. Similarly, on the, on the Senate side, the longest tenured uh, members of staff on those committees in the Senate are also appropriations, armed services, uh, finance, banking, things like that. So you do get a sense in, uh, from this first chart of the notion that those committees that are traditionally seen as prestigious, and this is not something we measured quantitatively, but just sort of looking as people who have studied the Hill, do in fact tend to be able to recruit people and get them to stay in that position or on that committee for a long time, kind of confirming the traditional wisdom that once you get a spot on appropriations, you might tend not to leave it. Um, if you look at the two very briefly tables on either side of that chart, we, we list across Congress what are the ten, what are the committees with the longest tenured staff members uh, and the shortest tenured staff members. So number one um, and two in all of Congress are the House and Senate appropriations staff that have uh, staff members with over seven or eight years of experience uh, on that committee. Again, just going back to 2001, so the theoretical maximum here is only 18 years to begin with. Uh, and then by contrast, looking at the lowest or shortest tenured committees, uh, Senate rules and Senate <coughs> Veterans Affairs um, at under three years or under two years for both of those. Um, so some of our st statistics provided, as Casey said, that common operating picture for others to look at what are the reasons for this and how does this kind of disaggregate into a more granular level. Um, but we were hoping to provide with this report some basic uh, common picture of where are we and how did we get here. So I'll let Casey talk about some of the other main findings that we came to as well. Yeah, the, the most common um, question you get from staff are th there's a there's a rational strategic action on the part of staff. Uh, they are often looking <coughs> at their next job while they currently hold their one now. And they, they want to know where to go next. And I don't think that, that's not a bad thing. You want people to move up. You want them to be ambitious in their own career. You will never blame someone for looking for a better job that pays better. Um, so they always want to know where is the best paying office? Who pays? Where can I get that money? And this is where we, I wanted to know. I didn't know that. I, I assumed it was appropriations because I guess they write checks. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it's true. And that we wanted to just lay this fact pattern in. So the next slide on your, your follow along book is just staff salaries uh, across each committee. And it varies wildly from a little less than 90 grand for the Natural Resources Committee to over 130 on average for House Financial Services, and you can logically think through why that is and, and where the lobbying ends up benefiting you based on what committees you serve on. Um, but we, don't we didn't necessarily know this, that there was such a huge difference of even across chambers and across committees. These are, these are wildly different salaries. And just a limitation of the data, this is average. So you're talking your, your entry level staff assistant on this committee all the way up to your most sen senior counsel. This is averages. So, uh, on a world where in personal offices it's really hard to make more than 50 grand in a house personal office, when you get to committees, you can see why people get there and they stick for a little bit. And even then, you're increasing mm -hmm. your outside Congress uh, leverage and power and networks and, and uh, potential earning income just by serving on these committees. But it's, a, it's quite a range, so I, I urge you to look through those and think about why that might be. And then the next one, the next question is, is there a, a gender gap? on committees? I don't know. <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no, depends where you look, because they are all in completely different offices. On one end of the spectrum, you have Senate Intelligence, dominated by men, over 70%. On the other side, you have Senate Rules, how small business. I don't know if we're able to speak to motivations of staffers across the board. It is up to them on where they serve, or at least they're, where they're interested in. Um, but that you can see, I think, uh, this morning, I was looking at all these. Uh, on average, it's 52% male in the House, or in the Senate, and 56 in the House. Or I think those are black backwards. Senate is 56 male. So those are, on average, the, the, the gender gap is, is not real uh, just based on male and female <coughs> positions. But on Senate rules, it's 75% female. Uh, Senate intel, it's 25% female. we got to think about why that is. Is that a, a, does that affect policy recommendations outside of that committee? I would argue yes. Five of 38 are within uh, a plus or minus 5% on their staff. Five of 38. So that means that there are discrepancies one way or another uh, across the board, and you, it, it's important to look at them uh, by themselves. But we're not ready to make individual level motivation uh, conclusions about why that is. 
And then you start adding these things together because it's one thing to say on average this is where women serve or this is on average what women make. But when we break it down broadly defined by type of uh, position, so your next slide, we start getting a little bit more of a granular picture um, about what women make versus men and what types of positions they hold. So there's two gaps here. One is the gender gap just based on uh, do they make less women versus men or not? Or is there an attainment gap that women do not advance at the same rate as men? They do not hold the same, are not as likely to hold more senior level positions. And we really find more of the latter. If you look at senior staff on women, they make 150 grand women due to men's 151 grand. Good paying jobs on senior staff and committees. But look at the difference in numbers of people that serve in those positions. Men are almost twice as likely to hold those more senior roles. So that's, an, that's a signal of an attainment gap uh, for a variety of different reasons, some good, some bad. Um, women just don't ad advance at the same rate or they don't choose to stay along uh, enough to, to represent those positions. The only position category that we found uh, women out earn men, and this is not that cool, is administrative positions. <laughs> These are your staff assistants, your, your executive assistants, your schedulers. Um, not a great uh, signal there that that's the only category that women outperform men. But across the board, uh, there is a gap. And for a, a cost of living city like Washington, D.C. is, every dollar counts, particularly when you're talking about staffers. A lot of times with student loans, they have to choose to bunk up with seven or eight people. A little bit of exaggeration, but it is tough to live here, tough to think about the long term, and you can understand why incentives uh, pull them outside of Congress, particularly on committees um, that are better connected to lobbying interests. The House Financial Services is screaming at me right now. So <laughs> this is a... And if I could just call yeah. out too, we previously, last December, put out a report specifically looking at the context of the Appropriations Committees. And in that context, we found that um, appropriations staffers who were themselves former lobbyists earned something like $19,000 more per year. Uh -huh. So interestingly, than appropriation staffers who had never been lobbyists, right? Uh -huh. So you can think about this as not just the revolving door being that K Street pays better, <laughs> but it's also even if your goal in it, career goal is to stay on the Hill, if you go do a stint in K Street, you can leverage that for more money even when you come back to the Hill. So looking at um, why appropriations yep. and financial services that are competing with K Street and Wall Street um, pay better and how we can you know attain more staff diversity in, in those pathways as well and just on that revolving door I don't know that that's a, a, a horrible thing I know that it, it gets a bad notion because then you have special interests influencing the policy process I get all that but don't you want people with more uh, wide-ranging experience there's something to be learned on the outside that then you can bring in so I, I urge you to to not paint that as just a bad thing that people will leverage their their earning potential uh, from the inside to the out and then back out onto the inside. But just think about what experience you're gaining on the outside. With that said, it's not great news either. I mean, to to, to pay people on the outside to pull them away and then um, basically throw them back into to influence the policy process on the inside. I, there's obviously perverse incentives that develop there, but uh, experience is experience, and I, I'm for one that. The more you have, the better it is wherever you can get it. And then finally, on the last main takeaway, just looking at the, the pay equity across committees. This was striking to us, too. Um, <coughs> men get paid more on average across committees. I think there's eight out of the 38 committees that we study that women get paid more. And the, on the smallest business, it's a, it's a sizable difference for women, 24% more. But there are... Um, 10 out of 38 committees, men get paid more than 20% more than women, on average again. So you have to factor in so many variables that it's hard to, to specify common causes, but if we're just looking uh, averages across averages, it's not a pretty picture for women. Um, I suspect, though we don't have the data yet to do it, as soon as Ryan and I go unblind from doing this, we'll try to tackle the, the diversity stuff and try start trying to, to level out uh, apples to apples comparisons there, but I suspect you're going to find an attainment gap. I do find that in house personal offices, and with that attainment gap comes the pay gap. And so these things are self-reinforcing, and they're true across uh, a lot of offices, though not every single one. So those are the main takeaways. Again, I urge you to read through it, look at it, because it does change uh, year over year, office by office, and just when you look at even Congress's funding across committees, you'll see it vary wildly. Um, in the 106th Congress, just staring at the Senate here, Committee's got 166 million. Adjusting for inflation in the 111th Congress, that's 305 million. That's a huge gap, over 150 million. 
And then now with the 116 Congress, it's down to 223 million. So for the offices that are most responsible for, for uh, creating policy, for advising members, working with special interests, working with members themselves, um, it changes year over year, and the staffers are subject to the changes that they almost have no influence over, even though they're the ones putting pencil to paper to, to write these things. So hopefully this is informative. Hopefully it's something that can uh, advance the conversation on something that we obviously care about just because we know the influences that staffers can hold. So uh, with that, if there's no other um, additional points to make, I'd like to open it up to, to all of us and start taking questions. Yeah, Ted. Um, I have a question for Dr. Scott. Um, has the foundation or the joint center done anything with regard to the Congressional Accountability Act and the, the absence of any ability to bargain over wages in, in a union context? Uh, and also, last year with the Me Too movement, there was an, uh, amendments that were made specifically to address sexual harassment but not racial harassment. Is, is anything being looked at with regard to the, now the office is called the Office of Congressional Workplace Rights? No, we haven't, we haven't gotten to that. It is, it has just been a, a lot to get to where we are, <laughs> uh, because I didn't get a chance to talk about the methodology of how do you define a person mm -hmm. of color, mm -hmm. and we had to go through a whole process there where people didn't self-identify. We had to try to go and find, because we couldn't have any errors because if we had one major error, one member's office calling us out, then everybody questioned your whole study. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to perfect the methodology of this, and then we'll look at some of the other issues. Yes, Richard. Um, yeah, I mean, when you look at committees, you can talk about prestige, and you can just talk about which committees are lobbying with. Those things probably have a positive correlation, but it's not a perfect correlation. So like the Financial Services Committee or the Banking Committee probably very heavily lobbied, not really that prestigious. On the other hand, if you look at say, the Foreign Relations Committees, extremely prestigious, lobbied, but not very heavily lobbied. I'm wondering, are you able to tease out any differences in career paths between people who work on you know, really prestigious and powerful committees and committees that are heavily lobbied. That's kind of a, another frontier for us, uh, what, what's next, to determine career paths, just to speak to, make recommendation, recommendations for staffers, knowing full well that this is not going to be a career for everybody, but it's something that you shouldn't avoid just because uh, it won't pay off later. So I, I think that investment talk is important. And uh, lobbying plays a role in that. That they're just information sources that, that as busy as committee and personal office staff are, they have to turn to special interest groups because they house that expertise and they house that information. So the next frontier is career paths with <coughs> the diversity involved and are those career paths different for certain people across certain offices at different times? And we don't know yet, but we do know that there with the lobby or the appropriations report that we did that they make more, they are seen as more valuable inside and outside. And like I said, I don't know if that's a horrible thing, but I know the optics are bad. Um, but I think we should capitalize on all types of experience. So lobbying's neck, and it, it, it's a wild west. If, if, if this data was hard to get, that one's even harder. And particularly, once they leave the hill, we can't track them anymore. Right. They have to come back for us to then kind of compare them to their previous selves without that lobbying experience. And now you're down to a small sample size, and you can't really make general trends, conclusions there. Yes, in the back. Um, so I think could you speak up? I'm oh, sorry. sorry. I have two questions. One is about committee tenure. So um, I know that Senate Judiciary often hires a bunch of clerks in response to major appointments, like a Supreme Court appointment. And do other committees do that? And would that skew the numbers? Um, and the second question I have is, do you, I somewhat think that people of color may not even want to work on the Hill because they tend to avoid very relationship-driven um, offices because it opens them up to more discrimination and more you know, meritocratic offices generally. Um, so it seems like, I don't know, there's somewhat of a, you know, hiring like practice, um, like improvement that can be made, but like do you think somewhat it's inherently, it's inherent that we'll never have, you know, full parity on the So if I could talk to the first question at least about sort of temporary staffing, right? Lots of committees have um, detailees from the federal government itself, 
they have national security fellows, they have like APSA academic fellows who come for a year, um, temporary staff up like you know judiciary does for appointment season and things like that. Um, those people, broadly speaking, we excluded from this report because they can skew it. Like if you're only working for Congress for a month and you're paid, you know, X number of dollars, like we don't want to just generalize that out to be, okay, over 20 years you would have made that, right? Because it kind of would skew the report. Um, so we excluded a lot of the temporary fellows um, and other temporary appointees. So the report is intentionally looking primarily or looking exclusively at kind of the core staff in who make up congressional committee um, organizations. Now I'll answer the, uh, the other question. I think if you say that people don't look for jobs because there's discrimination, there would be a lot of jobs that wouldn't have being African American working there. I think that a lot of African Americans look at where they can have an impact or where they are needed. And people are attracted to come and work on the Hill because they can have an impact on the policy and legislation in this country. And so they, they feel like they can come in and change also. So by them being there, it's just like you wouldn't have any black people working in policing, but yet you find people that decide they want to work in policing because they feel like if they join in the department, they may can bring about change. They can do something different from what they found. And jumping back off Ryan's point, like we are subject to just skewing with temporal concerns. So you can we pull this data on a, on a, the same day for every committee, but calendars really impact. Uh, committee decisions on who they staff up. So I'll always say that committees are really purposeful in who they hire. If you want to look at the priorities of that particular office or that particular committee, look at their staffing decisions. That's the resource that they are able to use uh, to affect their, their jurisdiction and their policy. So when you pull the data in 2008, you're going to see a huge increase in um, healthcare staffers on those particular committees or the, the, the bailout committees. Like there's a they need those resources so committees use their what limited discretion they have they use it to, to hire those staffers so we have our data is not perfect um, how we classify it you'll you'll ask ten different people and get nine different answers of if you did it correctly but that's the beauty and curse of being first you you get to decide that at some point is just as long as you can defend it and and we'll sit up here and try to explain these things as we can but uh, I think it's important to, to point out that we are subject to some limitations on when we do this and just making those those problems clear out front. Yes? Um, <coughs> with respect to the maybe tenure of staff, uh, it seems to me a major factor is how long chairman is. Mm -hmm. If chairman moves, staff moves, disappears, not to mention control of the chain. Right. Uh, is there any way to tease that out? We just so we do, series yep. we do talk about aggregate. This wasn't in the slides, but it is in the report. We, we show by every committee um, since 2002 how much their staffing level has changed year over year. Um, and also we break that down by the type of staffer. So you can see that like, as Casey mentioned, um, in, two, in 2009 after the 08 elections, um, House Financial Services really staffed up because they were writing the Dodd-Frank Act, right? Um, House Appropriations really staffed up. You can see that when the Republicans took back uh, the Senate in 2014, certain committees downsized their staff quite significantly, um, which you know, anecdotally you could look at as reflecting different prior policy priorities by those um, incoming chairmen. Uh, I think broadly too, if you look at by category of staffer, one thing we found was that committees, broadly speaking, have increased the percentage of staff who are responsible for communications and messaging um, and pretty significantly decrease their administrative staff load. Um, so you can get it, we, we do that at an aggregated level by committee and sort of by each type of staff, but you can get it questions of partisan change and things like that. And, and that's why we, we did the three types of tenure because I think they're all important for different ways. So uh, to get at issues of retention, so which committees are good at keeping their staff no matter if there's chair changes or majority mm -hmm. status changes. So like with approps, uh, both House and Senate have a a committee tenure of over seven years. So that that has, at least on the House side, two flips and uh, chairman changes. So you get at some measure of that. When those numbers are low, you can start, it'll start zeroing you in on which <coughs> committees are subject to discretion of the chair and who they hire and fire, um, which staffers roll with their chair, but either back to the personal office or look for somewhere else. You can get at that. There's no systematic or, 
conclusive way that you can do that. But uh, we really wanted to focus, just as a test of assumptions, uh, which committees are good at keeping policy staff that are more insulated from the political happenings or not subject to, um, they're, they're hired and kept for their expertise. And so it's true on some committees, which was enheartening to find and not true on others. <laughs> yes, in the back. Uh, so I know uh, the discussion is focused on committees, uh, but Dr. Scott, would you speak any uh, at all to any incentives or motivations that might help uh, diversity as far as personal offices is concerned? Well, I think that by establishing the diversity office in, in the house, that's going to improve because you have somebody there who's specifically assigned to receive resumes and to uh, <coughs> and to track and to track diversity also. And I think she'll be responsible for making and reports. And people, one thing you find when you're doing these reports, if there's any way to identify the members, they're going to be <laughs> sensitive to it. Yeah. And so, the it didn't happen in the first report on the Senate side. Didn't identify individual members, but by identifying the individual members and and the Senate, well, there were individual members identified on the Senate side, but it was like the ones that had good diversity. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to flip it this time to <laughs> do both the ones that had good numbers, but also to show the ones that didn't have good numbers. And this has created much more interest <laughs> in diversity. <laughs> so one, one follow-up to that, do you think that there'll be a balance um, between certain numbers that are like, well, I may not have a lot of that, uh, ethnic or racial diversity, but like half of my staff is women. And that would be like their justification towards where they stand. Yeah, we heard some of that when we were doing the study. And then we also heard that my district, my district director is a person of color, right. especially where they had large numbers. That doesn't account. Yeah, it does count, but this study is focusing on the policymakers in your DC office. And so whereas we are very pleased that you have good constituent <laughs> services, <laughs> and the next study might look at that, but that is not the subject of this study. Hi. So in the offices that had, uh, or it, the committees that had better tenure, and the variables that you looked at, what were the variables that you think contributed to the longer stay? And if you could see other variables, or wanted to look at other variables, what do you think the other variables would be that you'd want to look at to get that stickiness for people to stay on board? Yeah, I think far and away it's going to be how well they pay them. I think that's just the, the be all end all for a lot of reasons of why staff choose to stay or go. Um, I don't know how far down the list, but next is going to be just environment. It's it's incredible how environment shifts from one committee to another, how hard your work, the expectations, if you are subject to a chair or ranking member that is prone to explosions. I mean, that's just, there's, it's, in, it's crazy how the environment changes just from door to door around here. And I think that's overlooked oftentimes. Um, other than that, it's just, uh, some people come to the Hill with the best intentions thinking they're going to change policy, and that's really hard to do. Uh, particularly now, you, you don't walk into a hugely influential role. Those are earned over time, so you have to make uh, economic sacrifices, you have to make position sacrifices, and, and even then you're not guaranteed to advance at a, at a rate where you are become an influential staffer when you think that you should. So motivations are at the individual level will never be mapped perfectly, but if you pay them better, they're gonna stick around, we know that. We're down to the transferability of skills based on the policy area of the committee might be something that's interesting to look at that we didn't really explicitly cover here, like with regressions or something like that. Um, you could imagine like in DC, if you've worked on the um, one of the intelligence committees, there's lots of clear jobs that tend to pay better on average. Um, financial services, you could imagine, leads to some high-paying job offers. So think, whereas, you know, other committees that are focused on more national policy areas where you can't as directly transfer those skill sets, or at least there's the perception that you can't as easily, uh, might be stickier if people have fewer options to jump ship. Mm -hmm. Yes? If I just pick up on what you two guys just said, uh, one of the strongest correlations is the conclusion that you can make in a recommendation is if Tenure and experience are good, and I think all of us would agree that. I say that, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. You gotta pay them. Yes. Um, I mean, there's so many staffers who I think would want to stay here, mm -hmm. but they get an offer from the private sector that doubles their salary. Uh, so all of the offices, the committees, and the committees generally pay better than the personal right. offices. If you want to you know, do a part two of the study, uh, you know, picking up off of some of Dr. Scott's research, looking at the personal offices and how they pay, because another major factor 
uh, you know, over the past decade has been that these um, staff budgets have decreased. Mm -hmm. And that has a major effect on the kind of staffing levels that you can have, also the diversity that you can have in the staffing levels. Absolutely. Full support. Yes. Casey, I seem to remember from some of your past writings that uh, Newt Gingrich would be speaker cut the committee staff by about a third. Yeah. Um, has that ground been made up not yet? Or uh, no. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it hasn't. There's been varying degrees over time. Like, uh, when Dems took back the House, they started reinvesting themselves uh, back in the 111th, and it was trickling up from there. Um, then Tea Party Wave came, and it got cut again. Um, overall, I, I just did it last week. I think there's a over the past 15 years, there's been a 1% increase. And the world has not got less complicated. Policy has not got easier to write. Um, the federal budget hasn't gotten smaller. Oversight has gotten trickier. Whole industries have been created in the meantime. So we're working with the same amount of resources in an increasingly complex world. And I don't know if that's good for really anything. One measure we looked at related to that in the appropriations report was the kind of an abstracted measure of the workload of an appropriation staffer over time. So looking at the size of the federal budget <coughs> per appropriations committee staffer. Um, and in the Senate side, it was something like a 55% increase in workload, right? The, the sort of, if you, if you theoretically divided the federal budget up among each staffer, they'd have had 55% more <coughs> oversight and budgeting responsibilities to take care of. So the world and the government has gotten more complicated and the staff levels have not kept pace. Right. Yeah, just go ahead. Um, I had a question about, uh, so the prestigious committees have the most experienced staffers, but my question is whether or not um, people from the less prestigious committees are moving laterally into those prestigious committees and therefore staying longer because they view it as a final yep. sort of stepping stone. Yeah. To, it's the final step for them. So how how much do you think it really is is people, like if they go on the appropriations committee, really just feel as though they've reached the final stop and so therefore they stay there rather than um, it's pay or something other kind of variable? Absolutely. It goes back to the individual motivations and it'll be different <coughs> from up for other people. Some people like the security of an appropriations that are, again, removed a little bit from the <coughs> political backs and forths. Others see it like that's time to cash in now. Like I got my network, I know, I'm known for an appropriations role. Uh, that's valuable outside deal. So it really depends on individual motivations. I, I can't map, but anecdotally, the backs and forths, people will take lateral moves. They'll keep the same position uh, on a more prestigious office. So you'll even see uh, moving it up into a leadership office while keeping the same positions. Where others, if they're going to make a move, they need to come with a title bump. I met with a member's office who his LD said, I have no more money to pay you, but I can give you any title that you write for yourself. And <laughs> people were like, that's serious value. If I can put a senior next to my name, that's, that's a, there's a value not in this office, but somewhere else. So it's weird the, the trade-offs that staffers will make knowing that it'll come back to them in, in the end. But uh, you'll see a general trend towards uh, the more prestigious issues, the ones that are associated with money and defense. Um, people will take lateral moves to go there and, and then leadership offices just because those networks are so valuable elsewhere. For Dr. Scott, um, as NIH an investigator, we have we struggle with how to define people of color. Also, so I was curious how you did, how you finally chose to do that. Okay, we ask well, we use Legistone as our primary source of data, and in Legistone, there are people who have self-identified, and and then we contacted offices to find out whether people people that did not have a designation as to what their their race was, and we tried to find out whether they were identified in office. And there were a few people that we ended up calling or sending emails to and asking them, how do you identify yourself? And that's where we got one person who said, we were biracial, they didn't want to be identified in any particular race. Mm -hmm. But we primarily had them to self-identify because we did not want to get into the thing of, oh, he looks black, mm. <laughs> and find out that he's Indian or something, you know. So, um, so we, we, we were very concerned about that and how that, what impact that would have on the study. Okay. Did you find any different relationships that were not traditional employment relationships? So, you know, for example, how many contract employees could you identify as contract employees? And also, were there shared employees where uh, an individual worked in two different positions? Right. So contract employees is not something that's in the data, um, so we don't, we don't cover that. 
Um, as to shared employees, we do cover that, um, and they're typically, I think, covered as, as being staffed to both committees. The sort of judgment call we made there was that a lot of committees, um, I'm thinking of like intelligence and appropriations, for example, will allow for each member to designate a personal office staffer as sort of a, a detailee for that committee. Um, it's a stronger association relationship than just being like, you're the LA for this issue set. It's sort of, you are actually in a shared responsibility role. So we did cover them as um, committee employees. Yeah. I was thinking of shared employees where you get money from two pots. Right, right. Is that? That's, yeah. sorry, yes, that's what we're okay. talking about. Yeah. And another common one is that committees will share like a finance administrator where they issue payments. It's not a full-time job for one committee, so two committees will split their salary. Um, and again, it's a judgment call. It can go either way on if you include those and how much they affect the process, but we did throw those in. Yes? I'm wondering if it's possible and if there are any plans to assess more demographic data of committee staffers such as uh, university of uh, education, uh, state of origin, age, a lot of other demographic data that could be uh, analyzed. Absolutely, the, the education pipeline is next. Okay. Outside of ethnicity, I, it, just uh, personal offices do member hire, <coughs> members hire within their own district. I, we have suspicions of certain relationships and then what's the, the Ivy League bump that you get when you come in as an entry level staffer with a Harvard degree versus okay. somewhere else. Um, it's next, and there's a, a lot of numbers to crunch there, but the, uh, it's available, and it's, it's going to suck. But it's going to be <laughs> One more. Any others? Thank you. Cool. Thank you guys so much for coming. Please let us know any questions. Have a great day.